Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm pleased to be here. A Yale University professor of law, history, and African American studies, Elizabeth Hinton is one of the country's foremost experts on policing, racial inequality, and criminalization. She is the author of From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, and her articles and essays have been published in The Atlantic, The Nation, and Time, among many other places. A New York Times review of her new book, America on Fire, calls it groundbreaking, deeply researched and profoundly heartrending. The book reveals the deep roots of the current movement to reject a system of law enforcement that defines as the problem the very people who continue to seek to liberate themselves from racial oppression. This evening, she'll be joined in conversation with Jill Lepore. Dr. Lepore is the David Woods Kemper Professor of American History and Law at Harvard University. She is also a staff writer at The New Yorker, and her many books include These Truths, A History of the United States, named one of Time Magazine's top 10 nonfiction books of the decade. Thank you so much for being here. The screen is all yours. Hey, great. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Laura, thanks so much for hosting these events. I can't say how much I admire everything that you do and what the free Library of Philadelphia stands for and how ardently I and I'm sure Elizabeth as well wish that we are in your beautiful building in a hall with all of you a little sweaty maybe coming in on the hot early spring evening it's really hot where I am uh, but kind of gathered together and sharing some air and the mumbling and murmuring of, of a space together and that sort of special vital energy that we could have together I just kind of wanted to take a moment to pause and conjure that for all of us. I've been watching videos lately of concerts in Central Park and imagining we get to do these things again together soon. Um, but even in this strange Zoom format, uh, it's just an incredible honor to have the chance to speak with Elizabeth Hinton, who is uh, one of the nation's most important historians. I urge you both to read her new book, America on Fire, that we'll be talking about Today, uh, you can find a link to purchase the book in, in the chat of this conversation this evening, um, but also her uh, really groundbreaking first book uh, from, the, from the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, which really changed the nature of a public conversation as well as a scholarly conversation among historians. And it's not a lot of books that have that kind of reach, that have the serious archival and empirical work that uh, Professor Hinton brings to everything that she does, and also just the kind of clarity, the moral clarity, the intellectual clarity of, of speaking to a much bigger audience about essential questions of our day and casting them in a historical light for, for all sorts of readers. So Elizabeth, it's great to be here with you and I'm excited to talk about this book, which I noticed the historian Eric Boner said could not possibly be more timely. And indeed that is, that is the case. One wishes, I think, uh, that it were less. So, um, but one of the things I really want to talk to you about is that the, the nature of those, these patterns, these historical patterns. Um, but what I want to begin with, you know, knowing that a lot of the people who are joining us here this evening haven't had a chance to read the book yet. I actually wanted to begin by asking you to think about um, a, a particular story. I mean, every incidence of racial violence is different. And I don't mean to be reductive here, but I wanted to invite you to tell us a story about a particular time and place, a moment that illustrates what you call the cycle uh, of, of violence, thinking from the 1960s and 1970s, which your book is primarily about, all the way down to the present. Well, first, I just want to thank you, Jill, for that incredibly all too generous um, introduction and also for your time, the honor um, to engage in this dialogue with you about this work is, is all mine. And then, of course, Laura and the Free Library for hosting this event, all of you for being here. Um, I too wish that we could be in person, but these conversations, especially in this moment, are so important. And um, and so I'm, I'm glad that, that we'll have an opportunity to engage. Um, so there, there's, there are many, many stories that are, that are kind of near and dear to me um, in the book. I guess one 
that is a thread throughout is the story of Cairo, Illinois. And, and that, um, the story of Cairo really kind of stuck out to me and felt like something that hadn't really been recognized and that needed to be told. For me, when I learned about the history of Cairo, it really haunted me because on the one hand, the, the violence in Cairo was particularly exceptional, but it also is kind of a warning about um, the, the kind of the end game or, or, or what can potentially happen if we allow racism and to, to, to guide our policies and, and white supremacy to steer the way in which we allocate resources and think about rights. Um, so Carol, you know, the, the, one of the, the kind of central premises of the book is the, the, the way in which police violence itself um, sets off a kind of cycle of community responses um, to that violence. And so there's the, there's the, little, the literal in, the, in these moments of political violence, the way in which police violence sets off community responses. So, you know, a group of officers who, or an officer, a single officer who, um, arrests a group of, you know, a kid or a group of kids for hanging out in the park after dark. Um, and the kids, you know, see, see this arrest itself as something violent and may respond by throwing rocks and bottles. The officer calls for backup. And then the, the violence can escalate from there taking on a variety of forms. So there's that literal cycle within the rebellion. And then there's the, the policy cycle where the response to this community violence is always um, more policing. In, in Cairo, the, the kind of cycle of, um, of rebellion and police violence, but also white supremacist terror was particularly protracted because of the, the, uh, the political and economic power structure in the city. And Cairo is, the, is a small town in the mid to late 1960s. It was, there were about 4,000 residents there. It's at the southernmost tip of Illinois. Um, at the convergence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. In some ways it's below, it's actually below the Mason-Dixon line, looks very much like a Southern city. And black residents there were just under the majority and locked out of political and economic power accordingly. This is also a moment beginning um, in, the, in, the, in the 1960s where we begin to see uh, the kind of, a white establishment embracing uh, vigilante violence and a politics of white supremacy that is different from the the kind of clan violence that had characterized so much of um, of the white supremacist terror throughout the 20th century. This is a kind of post Brown v. Board phenomenon that is very much in response to the the kind of the gains of the civil rights movement. In Cairo, activists for years had used nonviolent channels to desegregate public institutions, um, to, to, op to, to demand political and economic power. Um, it was a site where the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and John Lewis came in the early 1960s to uh, desegregate public institutions. And none of these efforts um, had worked to secure basic rights for, um, for Black people. And by the late 1960s, uh, the, the white vigilante mobs that had formed there in kind of cahoots with law enforcement authorities and political economic elites essentially, essentially unleashed um, terror on the black community. Beginning you know, in March, 1969, a group of, uh, of white men stood on the Mississippi levee and began to shoot into the Pyramid Courts housing project that was segregated and entirely black. Um, so that, you know, for years, the children who grew up in this housing project slept in bathtubs out of fear that they could, that they were susceptible to um, getting shot by this vigilante mob. And, and the Black residents in Carroll had absolutely no protection against this violence uh, because the, the power structure, the, the vigilante organization called the White Hats took on a, ver a variety of forms, but known popularly as the White Hats. Um, was deeply, deeply embedded in the, 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 the county and local um, law enforcement. And so in response, the, the, the Black residents in Cairo armed themselves in self-defense and continued their nonviolent campaign. They launched a boycott that lasted um, for several years of all the white uh, owned stores in, in the district, essentially saying, we're not going to, um, to, to, to patronize these business owners so that they can go and buy bullets to then later shoot at us. Um, 
And the and you know this went on for years. Of course, the the newspapers reported it. You know the dominant kind of media narrative about this is that these armed militant black men were indiscriminately shooting at white residents in Carroll. This is how the story was um, portrayed to most of the to to much of the nation. Much of the news coverage kind of took that uh, took that stance. Um, but you know the the lesson here is that rather than actually concede to black residents demands um the political and economic elites of Cairo allowed the stores to close they 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 refused to um to give political and economic um rights and resources to the black community in Cairo who suffered from extreme rates some of the highest rates of poverty um in the state and who's who 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 basically had only access to dilapidated shack housing or um, deteriorating housing projects. And so rather than, you know, concede these rights, concede these resources and, and basic human needs, the political and economic elite there just allowed the city to die. They, they, they allowed the, the, the economy to tank. They allowed the businesses to close. Their children, if they could, left. Um, and and this is where you know this is a a real kind of warning for us about the dangers of again holding on to these these racist white supremacist views that that this is that racism is is a disease that in the end will 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 harm all of us and that we will all be better off if we work to foster a more inclusive society and that the the kind of entanglement between law enforcement and political and economic elites is a partic particularly deadly combination that we see playing out in various forms again and again. But for me, Cairo was just this metaphor that again, you know, these stories of like German shepherds being unleashed on young black children in, in the city as they were walking home from school into the 70s, for me was even surprising just in terms of, you know, like the extent to which this kind of racism was still very much alive and structured social relations in the years after the civil rights movement. Yeah, that's such a it's such a powerful and distressing story. And the way you to hear you talk about it now reminds me a lot of Heather McGee's argument in the Some of Us, the kind of drain swimming pool theory that right. whites will again and again give up all kinds of public goods um, for the sake of denying them to other people. Um, which Cairo is a, just a really uh, distressing version of that story, but there's also a lot more going on there. And I, I wanna think a little bit about, I, I got lost in the timeline that's the appendix to the book, which I don't think all readers would get lost yeah. in, which is this really staggering list, you know, year by year, town and city by town and city um, that you compiled working um, with, Kerner Commission records, the records of the Lemberg Center and the work of Christian Davenport. And so I wanted you actually to, to, so having now looked at this one place in a particular moment in time, sort of one of the things I hear you saying about the story that you've just told is how it, it, it changed your notion of the timeline, right? That, that, that these, these rebellions don't end in 1968, they go into the 1970s, we need to think differently about the timeline. But I kind of wanted to ask you, to tell me a little bit literally about the timeline, that is to say about the body of evidence that you compiled here, you know, with collaborating with people like Christian Davenport on that timeline, because reading the book, it's just relentless. It does not stop. It just keeps happening again and again and again and again and again. And I, I, I'd, I'd love to hear what that was like for you as a researcher, as you put that together and as you laid that all out and thought about you know, how am I, how am I going to communicate the ubiquity and the ceaselessness of this cycle? So I, I love that question. And I thought, Jill, of like, if anybody, you know, like I knew that you would. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to nerd out on your and, and And I will say, too, um, I am deeply grateful to Jill because Jill read a word version um, of the manuscript uh, without the timeline included. So this is this is a post vision, <laughs> and it's actually um, one of the things that I am the most proud of in the book. And and for me, it it gave me an opportunity to kind of lay out all my data, um, to show to actually prove that um, that that this that these incidents were widespread and to disrupt these kind of 
conventional historical narratives that we have. For me, the timeline is a gift for future historians. I think it opens up all kinds of new questions, but it also shows us that we all have a stake, that this history um, impacts all of us and that we all have a stake in this, that, you know, the, that what happened to George Floyd and Derek Show, you know, Derek Chauvin's trial was not, uh, you know, relegated to the to Minneapolis. That it's it's part of a national story. And I would bet that that most um, that, or that many of us, um, if not all of us, can find our hometowns or a place that we've lived or passed through or lived near in the timeline. So it is a 25-page compilation. Of, of all of the cities, um, according to the, to the archives that I use, that experienced some form of rebellion. And um, my, the, the, my archival source base for the first part of the book, which really looks at what I call the crucible years of rebellion from 1968 to 1972, um, is based on the Lemberg Center for the Study of Violence Records. And the Lemberg Center formed shortly after John F. Kennedy Jr.'s or John F. Kennedy's assassination. Um, uh, and sought to, to document and track um, conflict in American society and violence, and not just the rebellions in, um, in, in US cities, but also anti-war protests, um, student movements, labor disputes. And this archive had, um, for the most part, been closed uh, to the public for, for decades and had been kind of like passed around uh, among a, a kind of a group of political science professors. It contains, you know, quantitative analysis of the of viol of the violence, oral history interviews, reports. But what I used were the newspaper clippings. Um, you know, essentially the Lemberg re researchers had access to all of these local news sources and just pulled these clippings and wrote little reports um, summarizing all of these incidents of violence. And so when I walked in, you know, I. Christian, I met Christian Davenport in 2016, shortly after I finished my first book. Um, we started talking about rebellion in general. He was getting ready to do a, a 50 year retrospective on the Detroit rebellion of 67. And he said, you know, come to my office. And, you know, it was very generous because a lot of scholars don't do that. He said, sure, come take a look. Um, he was doing the quantitative side of this. And when I went to his office, again, this is a very different archival experience because it's, in a, pri it's in, in, in a more private place. Um, it was just boxes and boxes and boxes and stories and stories and stories of this history that I had a sense of, that I had a sense that I thought might have happened when I wrote my first book, but there was no way to actually capture it. And it just opened up all kinds of new questions um, for me. And, and it especially showed or it reinforced the, the impact of federal crime control policy and the way that communities responded to the expansion of policing and the militarization of, of police forces and targeted low-income communities of color um, after the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act passed, which is the first major piece of federal law enforcement legislation in 68. The narrative that I had, that many of us had, and, and I even you know advanced it in my first book, is that you know, the era of rebellion begins in Harlem in 1964. And then, you know, this, there's this unprecedented violence during the, the rebellions in uh, Newark and Detroit in the summer of 67. And then the kind of last hurrah are the hundred or so incidents that follow the assassination of Martin Luther King in April, 1968. But what right. this time, what the timeline shows and what the Lemberg archive reveals is that actually the peak years of rebellion um, were, after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination and followed the enactment of the Safe Streets Act from, so from 1968 through the early 70s. There were about, I think, 350 incidents from, uh, from 64 to, to Martin Luther, including Martin Luther King in, in April 68. And from May 68 through 1972, there were, um, by, 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 my, by my count, according to the Lemberg Archive, 1, 000, about 1,950 um, incidents in, in a little, little under a thousand cities. And so this is really important because it shows how, you know, the, the earlier experimental programs of the war on crime, which Johnson had declared in 1965, as they began to hit smaller cities like Cairo, like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, like Carver Ranches, Florida, like Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
smaller cities across the United States, rural communities, mid-sized cities um, that were not the initial recipients of the, of the grants earlier in the decade, once these smaller police forces expanded, militarized, uh, residents responded in much the same way as their counterparts in, in the larger cities. And, and this is why the, the timeline is so key because it, it makes that it makes that very clear. It's an argument that I make in the book, but the timeline itself mm -hmm. um, really gives an entirely new sense of the way in which Black people in particular in targeted communities responded to the policing of everyday ordinary activity. And that, you know, this was again, a national phenomenon. The, 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 there's, there's been an emphasis, there's been, a, the, the idea is that, um, you know, so-called rioting was a, was a Northeastern you know, occurred mainly in the Northeast. And, and this shows too that, you know, in, in the Southern states, which are often seen as like, you know, being, being part of a kind of nonviolent movement exclusively, that rebellion occurred very frequently and that it also occurred in the West and the Sun Belt and in New England, um, that it was a national phenomenon and that there are certain patterns that we can glean from it. Um, so in that sense, you know, I think the book, but the timeline especially, really opens up new questions about Black protests and really opens up, again, new questions about the policy responses to that protest and the continued embrace of police um, and surveillance and later incarceration as a solution. Yeah, no, it's really essential. And I had, you know, a thousand more questions about the timeline, but I want to just ask one because I don't, not everybody's going to be as obsessed with it as I am, but it, it made me think a little bit about, um, you know, many years ago, I wrote a book about an alleged conspiracy of enslaved people in New York City to burn the city down in 1741. And analytically, it seemed really important to me to say, do you know what we could think about this population of enslaved people as? We could think about it as a political party. Because we think about New York in the 1730s and 1740s as having been the origins of the, the a tolerance for a party system, which is just a whole other unrelated thing. But like, just and like, and I kind of tried to put that out there. Like, we could think about this group of people as a political party in the classic political science sense. They they have a shared set of political objectives. They're acting together. They have leaders who represent their views. Like, why can't we think about these people who are enslaved? Okay, they're disenfranchised. Why can't we think about them analytically as a political party? Because it would help us take seriously right. what they're doing as a politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I thought about that. It, somehow this argument didn't really stick. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't really transform that discussion. But I thought about that here because one of the things you insist on at the very beginning of the book and then throughout, and I think you make this case very persuasively, is that it's a huge disservice to our understanding, certainly. In the, in the moment um, to the public's understanding, the larger public's understanding of what was going on. But it's a huge disservice to our historical understanding of this political moment to not think about this as a, as a, as a politics. That, so, so to say these are riots and this is a kind of criminal activity is to, is to misunderstand the nature of these actions that you are taking them like out of the box that says crime and putting them into the box that says politics. And the one way you do that is to say, we don't, we don't call these things riots, it's a misnomer, right? And that we wanna look at riots, we can look at white riots. Mm -hmm. um, we wanna, we, we, we're gonna call them rebellions. And then you have this body of evidence that shows the pattern that this is a national political movement. But what then is the political argument of the rebellion? Mm -hmm. If we think about this era and think about these actions in many different places that we can now because of your work, you know, look, and because of the work of the Lemberg Center, really look at across the timeline, what is the political argument of this form of political expression? Yeah, and, and that's why too, I think, you know, the, the, the patterns, I mean, every, every rebellion was distinct, of course, and has a distinct set of actors and causes, but there are these clear patterns and there are, there are these very well articulate de articulated demands that often emerge out of them. So, you know, I, I think um, one of the one of the things that's that's really important to understand, and this was, you know, true and as true in 1964 as it was in 1972, although there are important shifts within kind of the mainstream civil rights movement occurring between those two years. And that is that, you know, the grievances behind Harlem, Watts, um, Cairo, 
Newark are all rooted in the same fundamental demands and grievances of the civil rights movement, right? The civil rights movement was about an end to police brutality, protection against white supremacist terrorism, uh, access to jobs, educational opportunities, decent housing, essentially full political and economic inclusion in American society. These are the same grievances and demands that, that, uh, that, that lead communities to erupt um, as, a, as a reaction to an incident of, um, or, or, or as a reaction to a police encounter, very often um, police violence. I think one of the things that is really important here too, and again, back to the timeline and why that like peak period of 68 and 72 is so important, is that you know many of the, the young people who participated in this form of political violence had kind of come of age um, or come into older teenagehood or adulthood watching the civil rights movement unfold and seeing many of those promises not be fulfilled even through um, nonviolent direct action channels. Similar thing, you know, we see in, in Cairo where, you know, th throughout the decade of the 60s, um, the black residents there had used the conventional tactics of the mainstream civil rights movement. And by the end of the decade, this had failed to protect them from um, the police officers arrest, arbitrarily arresting them and the white vigilante mob shooting into the, the housing project. So the, you know, we see this shift, I think, especially um, encapsulated by Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, where especially among young black people, the the, the thrust of civil rights protests shifts from nonviolent direct action to these ideas of self-defense. And increasingly, you know, the response to uh, the expansion of policing and the, the strategies of the war on crime that, that promoted the policing of, um, of everyday ordinary activity in the, under the idea that um, the best way to stop crime was not to stop it when it occurred, when it actually occurred, but to um, identify people who might commit crime. This is a legislative category that emerges in the 1960s, you know, potential delinquents, potential criminals that officers were, um, were charged with finding and apprehending. And so, you know, the community responses to that, especially when these officers are now carrying surplus weapons from Vietnam, like M4 carbine rifles and M16s and bulletproof vests and riot control helmets and three foot baton sticks and all of these new technologies that um, that police departments have due in large part to the new federal grant funding um, really changes the, the kind of terrain of protest. Um, and and the, the, the demands that emerge out of um, out of these out of this out of these moments of political violence where you know many civil rights leaders in the community and and in black churches just like that that had steered the mainstream civil rights movement take the the violence as an opportunity to continue to wage sets of demands on municipal authorities again attempting to advance the same goals that um, that had steered the freedom movement historically so in many ways this you know, I see this as uh, a kind of next chapter of the movement, a continuation of the struggle that we're still very much living in the aftershocks of, but yet we still haven't fully appreciated. Um, and, and doing so, you know, recognizing this also forces us to, um, to confront some of the, the shortcomings of the, of the civil rights movement and the progressive reforms of the 60s. So how do you take us, uh, I know that um, people who are watching will are gonna have a lot of questions about where we are now. Um, so before we go to questions from people in the audience, I, I wanna ask you to help, help us get from that 1972 marker of time to 1991 and Rodney King and down to 2020. And I mean, there's a certain amount of leapfrogging. Yeah. When, when, <laughs> <laughs> and the book does a certain amount of leap. Yes, yeah, yes, because we're all everything. You know, everything you're reading about sixty to seventy two, you're just thinking about how come this didn't end then? <laughs> because, right. the, like, I think the question is just like every page of this book, like, how come this didn't? Like, why wasn't? How are we still? Um, but a, a, a really, to me, 
fascinating distinction that you drew between this, the era that we're talking about, the sort of long 1960s <clears throat> and today is you remarked that in 2020, instead of attacking police cars and police stations, although there was some of that, that a lot of protesters attacked monuments. Um, and I was fascinated by that uh, as a, as, as a fairly signal difference between these two moments. And I, I, I wonder if you could help us to understand why that would be. What is it about history? And even in fact, this history, this is kind of like a meta question. Like there's a kind of meta quality to Black Lives Matter. It's not just about Black Lives Matter and now, it's about all the ways in which this struggle has been fought and fought and fought and fought and fought, right? Like our great grandfathers fought this struggle. I think, you know, you hear people say, in very poignant way, you know, my grandmother tucked kids into the bathtub. Why am I tucking kids into a bathtub, right? Like, um, so that 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 sense, and partly this is why there's something even meta for me about the timeline, right? Which asks us to put ourselves on a timeline. Like, right. why in 2021 are we here? Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. Like, what? Where are we in time? So I'm sorry, I threw a lot of different things at yeah. you, but. I guess I'm 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 wondering if you know how how you get across that that river right from seventy two to ninety one mm -hmm. as a historian and and where, where how do we get to twenty twenty one? Okay, I'm going to try my best to uh to to do this gracefully, but bear with me, everyone. So, you know, I I so after we we. Through, rebellion continues through the 70s, but at a much less frequent pace. And part of you know the end point in 72 is that the Lemberg, the Lemberg Center closes in 73. And so you know hopefully again this work will open up new questions. I mean there there are reported incidents of of rock throwing and continued clashes between police and communities. But we know that by 72 the levels begin to resemble what they did in 64 and then fizzle out. Um, I think part of this. You know the 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 kind of um, decline of rebellion in the '70s has to do with um, advances, very important advances in terms of black political representation. Of course, the Congressional Black Caucus forms in, in 1971. Many of the young people who couldn't vote, um, you know, in the 1960s, and due in large part to the voting drives of the civil rights movement, um, you know, mobilized to elect. Um, black officials at all levels of government leading to um, a, a kind of representation that hadn't been enjoyed since Reconstruction. And, and I think that um, had a direct impact on the, the, the kind of frequency of this kind of violence because um, people in many cities who were, who were previously excluded or prevented from any kind of political and economic representation were beginning to see, um, see themselves on city councils and in, and in city hall. And, and I, I think this makes an important difference. Also, of course, you know, during this period, you're, this is when you, you begin to see the, the rise of mass incarceration. And by the mid-1970s, the, um, the transformation of the U.S. prison system from being majority white to majority black and brown for the first time in, in U.S. history. So a number of, the, of the, the young people who might have participated in these rebellions were getting locked up under increasingly long terms. Um, and and the you know the big question is this that you know this 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 collective violence that was once expressed um, against external forces against police and repressive institutions increasingly turns internal um, in the form of of gang violence and community warfare beginning in this period as well. So there's a there's a lot going on in that sense. Um, it also kind of indicates that you know perhaps. Um, residents and communities that were being policed in new ways under the banner of the war on crime had accepted the kind of policing, you know, the breaking up of house parties, the arrests of groups of teens, you know, just hanging out, um, the kind of police, the everyday police brutality or police aggressions that, um, that had once kind of sparked community outrage just became bitterly accepted. Mm -hmm. And so by, you know, Miami in 1980 and Los Angeles in 1992 and beyond, you no longer see eruptions in response to the kind of, again, what I've been saying again, the policing of everyday life. You see them in response to um, exceptional incidents of police violence or miscarriages of justice. So both Miami in 1980 and LA in 1982 
are not about actual incidents of police brutality. In Miami, um, a group of police officers savagely beat a, um, a black motorist to death and then attempted to cover it up. And then 92, um, four officers uh, beat Rodney King in a, in a videotaped um, incident of brutality, which is kind of like the first viral video of police violence, right? But it wasn't those incidents that set off the rebellions themselves, it was the acquittal <laughs> It was the lack of accountability for the officers in both cities that led to particularly um, violent um, eruptions. I mean, Los Angeles was um, the, the the property destruction and the arrest tally in Los Angeles was is and remains um, unprecedented. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting about the, the the kind of uprisings or the violence that we've seen in response to mainly police killings um, from, you know, during Obama's second term from Michael Brown and Ferguson onwards is that they all started in response. They, they all started nonviolently. Um, you know, they all started at nonviolent protests or peaceful vigils when police responded to those protests with tear gas um, and beating people with their batons and making mass arrests. Um, again, setting off this cycle of police violence and community violence where some of the protesters then responded um, with violence and responded by setting buildings on fires and responded by looting. Um, but this indicates that, you know, that the protests themselves, um, people who are demonstrating for racial justice and against police brutality ha it, have gotten increasingly less violent than um, their counterparts in the 60s and 70s, and even in LA 1992, in Cincinnati, um, Ohio in 2001, um, and yet levels of police violence have uh, maintained themselves. And I think that that helps us to understand the, the, the kind of emphasis last summer on um, defacing or removing or attempting to destroy um, monuments to white supremacy to I mean especially you know celebrating confederate soldiers but also um conquistadors and 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 figures who are celebrated um for uh brutality murder genocide and and a white supremacist politics um and I think part of this has to do with a, a kind of new scripts of resistance um and a, and, a, and a different kind of awareness and reckoning with history that in many ways is the product of the, you know, one of the ma major achievements of the civil rights movement. And that is of course the um, expansion of um, college and university education to, um, to students of color and the, you know, where I am, right? African-American studies departments and, and new scholarship and, and new um, scholars who have exposed this history so that we know you know, more about it. Um, but I think, you know, one of the interesting things about Black Lives Matter is that it, it really, you know, synthesizes both the kind of the strains of the, of the freedom struggle, right? I mean, in embracing the nonviolent tactics of, um, that are associated with Martin Luther King, kind of the mainstream civil rights movement in the 60s with a, with a kind of militancy and, um, and structural analysis that is often, although unfairly, associated with the Black Panthers and the Black Power movement. Um, and I think that, that that kind of language, that understanding, and the new kind of reckoning and understanding of um, systemic racism in general and the history of racial oppression and exploitation in this country um, has you know, helped to, to shift the focus to these monuments, these symbols of, of white supremacy as a powerful way to, uh, to, to protest uh, for racial justice and to, um, and to see immediate results and to reclaim. I mean, you know, one of the things that was just uh, really remarkable about what we saw at the monuments last summer is that people made them into murals. Like in Richmond, people painted, you know, pictures of George Floyd on the statutes of Confederate Confederate soldiers. And so in this moment of like national mourning, national reckoning, it was also about reclaiming in a way that didn't, um, that didn't cause harm, direct harm um, to an individual person.
Um, I want to encourage everybody uh, to use the Q and A function to raise questions. And I, uh, sadly, we would love to pull up your faces and see them and hear from you. But that's not how Zoom works in this webinar. Um, so I'll be reading some questions. And I, I have a question that follows up from what you just said, which I think was just incredibly helpful in thinking about um, the different streams of, of political style that contribute to Black Lives Matter. That's drawing on. Um, uh, the nonviolent tradition of of civil rights, but also on some of the structural analysis of you know the Black Power movement. But then it also has this kind of African African American studies element to it with regard to kind of moral reckoning, which I think also I would say comes out of the American Indian movement or the Columbus the Columbus 500th anniversary in 1992, which generated a lot of attention to monuments and instruction, right? Um, you know, even just thinking to the 60s and the demands for Mexican American studies, Chicano studies, like there's just a lot, you know, that that's coming into let's 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 win some elections, let's gain some political power, but let's also tell the story, right, right, right. Um, and have a different public account. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if people want their names used or not, so I'm not going to use names, um, but. Uh, there's a quick question in the Q&A. Do you see a correlation between this history and the political movement uh, erasure of Black history in the classroom? So, and, and I actually wanted to, um, I'm just going to follow up with that important question about some of these curricular matters that, of course, very much part of this kind of cultural war we're in at the moment. Um, because in the, in the conclusion of the book, you, you, you know, you talk about kind of the so-called reckoning of last summer. And you list some of the things that came out of that, the corporate statements, Quaker Oaths taking a st stand or whatever, high schools being renamed. And you say um, that these things are, as you write, insufficient substitutes for the structural transformations that Black Americans have long been calling for. So in, in response both to the question in my critic, I'm wondering like, how important is the classroom piece? How important are these structural transformations? What are those structural transformations? Is one of them the classroom? Like, what? How do you understand the relationship between these different kinds of transformations that you know, we are undergoing or wish to go undergo? Well, in in some ways, in order to bring about the kind of tra structural transformation that are necessary, structural transformations that are necessary, and and the frankly the um the mode of governance that will be necessary, where you know these social problems are not responded to with policing and prisons, but are responded to with resources, responded to with job creation programs and um, the expansion of educational opportunities. So much of that is a hearts and minds um, battle where, you know, where here education is so important, right? To understand the way in which um, discrimination, racial oppression has shaped political and economic development in the United States. And so it's not, Surprising that in a moment when, you know, in the aftermath of, um, you know, ten, tens of millions of people taking to the streets and what some people are saying, are, you know, is the largest social movement in US history, demanding racial justice, demanding social justice, making links between, you know, issues of police brutality and climate change and LGBTQ plus rights, you know, all of this has to do right with our investments, how we allocate um, our resources. And, and, and why we, we have privileged um, policing over meeting other basic social needs and a definition of public safety that says that communities are can be kept safe by arresting people and putting them in prison, um, which as we know now, and this is you know one of the things I think both of my, you know, my, my research really aims to show is that you know this path, this punitive path, um, when alternatives were consistently presented has been uh, a humongous policy failure. Um, but it's in, you know, in reaction to the fact for one that systemic racism became a buzzword um, last summer. Um, and, and, and these conversations about how we remember history and, and who gets to be remembered and who gets to be celebrated were really challenged um, by by the protests, I mean, both you know, in in the kind of rhetoric of protests itself, and and the the issues that were brought to the floor, but then also, right, what you know, the the literal um, defacing of of monuments and the call to pull um, many of these monuments down, 
so there is there is a kind of um feedback loop um you know i, I think the juneteenth you know the, the fact that juneteenth was made a federal holiday and many people have made this point you know in a moment when critical race theory is coming under attack when you know in some places um if 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 some of these bans are are fully implemented the history of slavery won't even be taught you can't explain um, juneteenth <laughs> right exactly yeah. um so you know i think i think that that most i think that what last summer demonstrated what the election demonstrated what even public opinion polling indicates about some of biden's policies is that most americans um do support uh, a different set of policies do support the expansion of public goods do support the pumping of new resources and investments into communities and um and as last summer indicate do support uh, policies that are based on the notion of equality. And this is, of course, also happening in a moment of immense demographic change in the US where, you know, most of the people under the age of 16, I think, beginning last year are not white by 2050. Um, white people will be the minority here. And I think that they're that that, you know, this is where democracy is at, is at the crossroads. Who who is American democracy for? I think most people want an expansive democracy. Um, and and this is this is an increasingly a battle to uh, or or a vision of the republic um, that is based on white supremacy, um, and to challenge that, you know, that's that that's about education. That's about breaking down the arbitrary things that divide us that are bad for all of us, as the Caro story demonstrates. Um, there's another question about political violence. So the questioner writes, America has always tolerated political violence, given that there are more guns now in the hands of private individuals, that is to say, than previously. There's a rise in tremendous spike in gun ownership, gun purchase, new for gun purchases this year. What do you see happening in the next few years? And I'm going to tack on to that, um, because also widely reported along with the increase in gun sales is the increase in violent crime. Yeah, so I think, you know, part of this has to do with um, especially the, the rates of gun violence, um, of course, can't be separated from COVID. And again, you know, just the the economic precarity that we're now in, you know, widening inequality and, and, and people feeling generally unsafe. Um, you know, I, I, I think the 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 persistence of gun violence especially in um low-income communities of color is a further indication that you know the 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 policy path again of the post-civil rights era the kind of punitive turn in governance has not effectively worked to keep people safe because one of the big questions that comes out of my research and that i pose in the book is that and that i think we really need to reckon with is that why in the communities that are uh where you know that are over policed, um, where you know where where enforcement is targeted, um, in, you know communities where incarceration rates are really high, young people are more likely to die either by a police officer or more likely um, by each other, right? Um, and and this indicates that public that that the, the, the definition of public safety, the idea that arresting people and incarcerating them keeps communities safe. Um, has not worked is not the answer. I think, you know, the 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 promising um, responses to gun violence and not just in communities of color, but across the United States is thinking about well, one, you know, harm reduction programs that empower community members themselves to intervene. So I'm thinking of programs like Advance Peace and um, in Northern California, it originated in Richmond. The program is expanding to New York City where um, where fellows that's what they're called, who had been involved in gun violence, mentor young people. Um, I think we need to, ex we need a, a more treatment-based approach um, to solving these problems because both, you know, what we've witnessed in COVID is that, and we see this, you know, even outside, in recent years, right, that, um, that gun violence um, among young black men in particular, but suicides among, by, by a gun, among young white men in particular, are particularly prevalent. And so, you know, the response, we need to think about how we can respond um, with treatment and, and with different sets of resources and not by punishing people. Um, now there's this kind of 
arms race, I think, because of the, the fear and the divisions out there and the miseducation that people think that the answer to fe the feelings of insecurity is to arm themselves, that, that, that having a gun makes everybody more safe. Um, and again, you know, there is a different vision that we can realize of, of, of what safety can and should be. One of the reasons people should buy and read this book and, and uh, Professor Hinton's first book is just been illustrated for us, which is how clearly you can speak about the patterns of the past that have got us here, but how, um, how willing you are to think about solutions, which is not the case with most historians. And it's so essential in this topic. Like I think your work more than anyone else's has, has, has it does the really crucial, hard, hard work of establishing empirically what a massive policy failure this has been. That everything that it was supposedly attempting to do, it has failed to do. And it has created a thousand other kinds of problems um, that even you know couldn't have been anticipated by uh, nefarious policymakers, no less those who had, were well-intentioned. Um, but thinking, of, thinking about those solutions is so important. Sorry, go ahead. Can I just jump in there real quick? Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. I just say that like, you know, I don't, <laughs> it's not, the solutions were there. I mean, that's one of the things that the archives show. Um, you know, yeah. I didn't think of all these solutions on my own. I think, I think I've compiled the evidence that, that helps make the argument arguments that other people made at the time that weren't realized. And I'm thinking especially of the Kerner Commission, um, who, you know, Johnson calls, as I'm sure many people know, during the rebellion in Detroit in 67, and charges them with studying the causes of, um, of the, the so-called riots in American cities during his presidency and suggesting solutions. And the Kerner Commission said, if we're serious about, if we're really serious about stopping this violence, we have to go beyond the war on poverty. We need a massive investment of resources into these communities. We have to think beyond the police. I mean, the Kerner Commission had a number of recommendations for police reform, but their, their actual program was much more ambitious and saying, we need to, to, to pump resources. We need essentially a Marshall Plan for American cities. And um, and we see similar recommendations time and time again. I mean, one of the you know other I think ones for me in the book that was really important was the proposal put forth by um, Crips and Bloods gang sets in 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 Watts um, during the LA Rebellion of 1992, saying you know invest different set you know as as you're rebuilding Los Angeles, we will stop uh, gang violence and invest different sets of resources so that. We, um, we, we no longer have to engage in informal economies and we can be empowered as a community. I mean, these, these solutions and, and structural analysis is presented time and time again, and yet um, it's never realized. And, and so, you know, you have to wonder what the US would look like today if the Kerner Commission's recommendations, if the Johnson administration would have had a very different reaction to the Kerner Commission report instead of not ever commenting on it and thinking it was too radical say you know what yeah that's what i want my legacy to be we're gonna instead of making a job creation program for police officers with the war on crime we're gonna make a job creation program for low-income americans we're gonna take the war on poverty a step further and that never happened and here we are uh so uh, uh one of the um members of the audience asks if the archives make clear that the rebellions peaked well after april of 1968 how do you think the narrative was constructed that it peaked with King's assassination and then calmed down? Are there specific groups that had an interest in deliberately constructing that narrative? Did academic historians take it up or did they have a key role in propagating it? And I guess I would ask you there too, what about the burying of the Kerner Commission report in that, in that moment, in that same moment in 68? Yeah, I mean, I, so, so I think, you know, part of it has to do with how, with, with national coverage. I mean, that's why this Lemberg, um, archive is such a gem because it's these tiny local newspaper clippings that um, that historians don't pay as much attention to. And it also speaks to the the kind of success of the um, the weaponizing of local police departments where, you know, in the late from the late 60s, to the early 70s, uh, the National Guard didn't have to be called. You didn't have to call, you know, for backup as much from state and county governments because local police departments were equipped with armored trucks and um, and and battering rams and some places helicopters and things that you wouldn't need 
um, to mobilize, again, the National Guard or federal troops for. And with that calling of the National Guard, with that big mobilization of force comes news coverage. So I think a lot of it, a lot of it is the result of news coverage and the fact that historians um, tend to, you know, follow kind of national trends as they begin to, to um, construct and craft stories. And so it's harder, um, it's harder to kind of craft a narrative um, of this post 68 moment as being one of, um, of a kind of continuation of this collective political violence. The narrative that gets crafted, we talk about this too, is really um, this, the image of the black sniper that emerges um, very much in, in a Vietnam War context, but that begins to kind of take hold as a, as a, as a way to explain the kind of the drama and violence of rebellion really beginning in Newark and Detroit. And, you know, this image of the black sniper, um, you know, waiting in the wings and on a rooftop, ready to shoot and kill a police officer um, becomes the kind of the, the narrative of rebellion. It's in part again, why the, the narrative about Carol was that um, the good white citizens of the city were being attacked. Um, and it leads again to the, it reinforces the logic of um, policing as a solution and, in, and increasing ideas about, or ideas that are, beginning to steer domestic policy away from war on poverty programs about um, criminality, especially in low income communities of color. So um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it just has to, I, I don't know if it's as much of a conscious thing as it is the difficulty of, of gathering sources and the fact that, um, that reporters, historians tend to, tend to focus on the big national story rather than, you know, what's going on in Waterloo, mm -hmm. Iowa. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you one more question, which is a selfish question of me to ask, because I'm trying to write a new chapter to my history of the United States, because it ended in 2016, and I have to oh, gosh. end it in yeah. 2020. And uh, I've been really, I will say, you know, knocked back on my heels at thinking, at just watching the the re-narration of the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol, right? So it seemed like on the day, everybody understood what was going on it was an armed insurrection of white supremacists. And now, you know, we're not having a commission to investigate it because it was just normal tourist activity. So I guess I'm wondering, um, this is the kind of question I will say, as this right often drives me a little batty, but like what, if you think about, say, that you know, the Trayvon Martin to George Floyd, um, seven, eight years down to now, what do you think will be the right way for historians to, mm -hmm. to, to narrate that and therefore for the public to under have an understanding of it? Um, and what do you see emerging as a as a competing narrative that you find very dangerous? Um, well, I think the competing narrative, uh, that, that's, that's the easier one, <laughs> that's the easier okay. one. The competing narrative, and I think we're already beginning to see it, um, is the usual narrative, right? I mean, we're beginning to hear uh, new talk about crime again. Um, and I think this is, again, this follows this larger pattern in a moment when it seemed like we were taking, you know, states were beginning to decarcerate. There's still a lot of problems with that process, but we were beginning to have these new conversations about um, about criminal the reform of the criminal legal system that now there's a new emphasis on crime, there's a new emphasis on violence. And so I, you know, that to me is, is dangerous. And I think it, it, it's very much a part of the, these culture wars and this campaign and attack against critical race theory. Um, I think, I think we'll remember, I think that, you know, the Trayvon to George Floyd to January 6th um, is, a, is a stark reminder of just how far we still have to go and, um, and has fully, I mean, I think especially with, with the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, um, revealed the, the, the kind of, you know, e even beyond the, the kind of the, the mobilization of white supremacy that we saw during the Trump administration. Um, but just the, the lengths that these competing visions of what America is um, are, yeah, I mean, I mean, how, how they continue to structure 
political activity, how they continue, can continue to structure debates and just how divided we are. All right, well, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening. I, there were some great questions in the Q&A that we didn't get to. Um, sorry for those of you who raised questions. I think you'll find some answers on Professor Hinton's most recent book. Um, and I, uh, I wanna encourage you all to show up again at the Free Library for its future slate of events. You can probably find more information about that in the chat and on the website. And um, I, I know we all hope to be together uh, in Philadelphia or some other city sometime soon. Elizabeth, thanks so much for taking the time and congratulations again yeah. on uh, this vitally important um, and, and searing work. Thank so you so much, Jill, for you taking the time and for your incredibly thoughtful questions. It really means a lot to me.